Hello YouTube! In this video we're going to look at identity, specifically identity as a logical or metaphysical property, the relation that each thing has to itself and to nothing else. This is sometimes put in terms of the law of identity, one of the basic logical principles. Everything is identical to itself. So first we need to draw a distinction between qualitative identity and numerical identity. So two things are qualitatively identical if they share all their properties, uh, and presumably there can be degrees of qualitative identity. Two things might share more or less properties. Um, I mean, it seems like two apples would have greater qualitative identity than an apple and a skyscraper. So I might say that you have the same apple as me, that, that your apple is identical to my apple, if we both have apples of the same kind, like if we both have Granny Smith apples. Um, numerical identity, on the other hand, is the relation that each thing has to itself. To say that X and Y are numerically identical is to say that they are literally one and the same thing. So numerical identity will entail total qualitative identity. If X and Y are numerically identical, then they must share all of their properties, regardless of how properties are conceived. Um, but yeah, when we talk about numerical identity, we just mean it's one and the same thing. Venus is numerically identical to the morning star. Bob Dylan is numerically identical to Robert Zimmerman. Um, indeed, Bob Dylan is numerically identical to Bob Dylan. Um, now, in this video, we are concerned with numerical identity. So when we say X is identical to Y, here that means that X and Y are one and the same thing, not two things that are very similar. Notice that we can interpret qualitative identity in terms of the numerical identity of properties. So if two apples share the same shade of red, then they share the same property. Um, it arguably, like, literally, numerically, one and the same property. Um, so, you know, ar arguably that's to say that, you know, the, the colour property instantiated by one apple is numerically identical to the colour property instantiated by the other. It depends on how you're conceiving of properties, but, you know, you might say that. Uh, in any case, our concern is with numerical identity. So, the law of identity can be stated in a few different ways. Um, here are some of the standard formulations. Uh, for all x, x equals x. Everything is identical to itself. Whatever is, is. These are a few different ways of stating this law of identity, this, this claim that um, all things are numerically identical with themselves. Um, now, identity stated like this, it seems totally basic and simple. It's perhaps the best candidate we have for a, a primitive concept, uh, one that cannot be further analysed. Still, we can say something about it. We can say something about the logical properties of identity. So, <clears throat> identity is reflexive because it relates x to itself. So, compare the relation equal to. I say 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 but 7 plus 5 is also equal to 7 plus 5. Um, a relation on some set is reflexive if it relates every element of that set to itself. Identity is reflexive because it relates everything to itself. Identity is symmetric. So if x is identical to y, then y is identical to x. Bob Dylan is identical to Robert Zimmerman. I can just as well say that Robert Zimmerman is identical to Bob Dylan. It, that basically means the same thing. Um, identity is transitive. If X is identical to Y and Y is identical to Z, then X is identical to Z. X and Y are one and the same thing. Y and Z are one and the same thing. So X and Z must be one and the same thing. So that's all pretty straightforward. Now, a standard view is that identity obeys uh, what's known as Leibniz's law or the principle of the indiscernibility of identicals. If x is identical to y, then x and y share all the same properties. That is to say that everything that is true of x must also be true of y. So, from the contrapositive of this law, if I know that x is f and y is not f, 
Like if I know that X and Y do not share all the same properties, so X is red and Y is not red, then I can infer that X and Y are not numerically identical. Uh, and you'll notice that this is a very standard kind of reasoning. Uh, if you accuse me of, let's say you accuse me of stealing the cookies, I show you some CCTV footage of the crime taking place, which shows that the person who stole the cookies had bright blue hair. I do not have bright blue hair, so it wasn't me who stole the cookies. In that case, we are applying Leibniz's law. Um, and it's so obvious, you probably don't even reflect on this when you make this kind of argument, right? Uh, this is just sort of something you take for granted. There are some apparent counterexamples to Leibniz's law, however. So, um, Venus is the morning star, right? But now consider this argument. So, premise one. Verity believes that Venus is a planet. So, Venus has the property of being believed by Verity to be a planet, right? Like, that's the way that, like, Verity relates to Venus, right? There's a specific kind of relation between Verity and Venus. Venus, Venus has this property of being believed by Verity to be a planet. Verity does not believe, however, that the morning star is a planet. Verity is unaware that Venus is the morning star, and Verity thinks that the morning star is a star. So the morning star does not have the property of being believed by Verity to be a planet. So Venus has a property that the morning star does not, namely the property of being believed by Verity to be a planet. But Venus is identical to the morning star, and this shows that Leibniz's law is false. Now, there's a lot that could be said about this argument. It raises a number of issues in philosophy of language concerning the attribution of beliefs. But one, I suppose, obvious problem here is with the inference from premise three to premise four. So just to go back, this is from the, the inference from Verity does not believe that the morning star is a planet to the claim that the morning star does not have the property of being believed by Verity to be a planet. So we might object to this inference. Since Venus and the morning star are simply different names for the same entity, then we would say, no, the morning star really does have the property of being believed by Verity to be a planet. Um, I mean, obviously it would be a contradiction for something to be both a planet and not a planet, but it's not a contradiction that a person believes something to be a planet but also fails to believe that it's a planet when they conceive of it differently. I mean, their, their beliefs might entail a contradiction, but there's no, you know, I mean, this is just somebody with, like, contradictory beliefs, right? This is just somebody with false beliefs. It's not that there's literally a contradiction here. And I mean, it's easy to see what's going on here, right? Verity doesn't realise that Venus is the morning star, so she's conceiving of Venus and the morning... She's, like, conceiving of these as two different things. Um, if she did realise that they were the same thing then she'd come to believe that the morning star is a planet. She's just unaware of this. Um, but, you know, she's... So so she believes this thing, this thing that we, we use the terms Venus and the morning star to pick out, she believes that thing is a planet because she believes that Venus is a planet. So she believes that the morning star, the thing that's referred to by the morning star, is a planet. So one way to, to put this point is that if we take the proposition, Verity does not believe that the morning star is a planet, we can read this in two ways. There's, there's two ways of interpreting this. So on one interpretation, we're sort of describing the propositional content in Verity's mind. We're saying Verity does not believe that, colon, the morning star is a planet, where the morning star is a planet is like a proposition. And so what we're saying is, is that, that the proposition, the morning star is a planet, is not affirmed by Verity. That proposition is not in Verity's mind. You know, she doesn't have the sentence, the morning star is a, is a planet, in her mind. That's kind of what we're saying. The alternative way to interpret it, though, is we might read this. So when we say Verity does not believe that the morning star is a planet, we might read this as picking out the morning star. So it picks out the object referred to by the morning star and then says of this object, that it is not believed by Verity to be a planet. But this is false, because Verity does believe that this particular object is a planet, because she holds the belief that Venus is a planet, and Venus refers to that object. And you'll notice that the argument against Leibniz's law assumes the second interpretation, but then the premise is false. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, 
yeah, you can you can only make the inference from uh, premise three to premise four in the argument against Leibniz's law if you're assuming that second interpretation, but that second interpretation is false. So, yeah, the general point would be, you know, Venus and the morning star. These are two different names for one and the same thing. So Venus has some property X. It, it, you know, it doesn't make any difference whether we use the name Venus or use the name the morning star or indeed use any other name. You could call it what you like um, to report that it has property X. So when we report that it has this property of being believed by Verity to be a planet, that's going to be the case regardless of what name we choose. Again, there are tricky questions here about belief attributions. Um, so the issue is like, we can't simply substitute these two terms in sentences that attribute beliefs, right? When I say Verity believes that Venus is a planet, that seems true. Verity believes that the morning star is a planet, that seems false. Lots of issues in philosophy of language here. Um, we don't need to get into this though. Um, Leibniz's law does not tell us that two terms referring to the same thing can be substituted in sentences without altering the truth value of the sentence, it's about the entity, right? So when we say, like, so, you know, the, the, the claim that if X is identical with Y, then X and Y share all the same properties, that is a claim about the entity that's picked out by X and Y. Um, now, denying Leibniz's law entails a contradiction. Uh, suppose that X is identical to Y, but that X and Y do not share all the same properties. So X is F and Y is not F. Well, since X and Y are one and the same thing, we would then have a case where one and the same thing is both F and not F, which is a straightforward contradiction. Of course, whether this would be a problem for somebody who doubts Leibniz's law is another question. Uh, after all, if Leibniz's law is in doubt, then it's maybe unlikely that our interlocutor will have too many qualms about doubting the law of non-contradiction. We'll come back to this point later. Um... But, you know, that's just, again, to kind of go through some of these basic logical properties of identity. So identity is is very simple, very straightforward. It seems, again, it seems like a very basic part of our conceptual scheme. Now, the simplicity of identity has led some philosophers to argue that there is, in fact, no philosophical problem about identity. There are no genuine debates about identity. David Lewis once put it this way, he said, identity is utterly simple and unproblematic. Everything is identical to itself. Nothing is ever identical to anything except itself. There is never any problem about what makes something identical to itself. Nothing can ever fail to be. And there is never any problem about what makes two things identical. Two things never can be identical. It's, um, it's a conceptual truth that everything is identical to itself. So if we ask a question such as, well, under what conditions is X identical with X? I, I mean, X is identical with X under all conditions. Given something X, it bears the relation of identity to itself that's it. There's nothing further to say. There's nothing further to debate. On the other hand, if we ask under what conditions is X identical with a different thing Y? Well, if X and Y are different things, then by stipulation, they're not identical. So there are no conditions under which they are identical. Part of the simplicity of identity is that identity is unitary, which is to say that there is only one form of identity. Uh, of course, here we mean specifically numerical identity. Of course, the word identity can refer to different properties, but we're just talking about numerical identity. Um, so what, what does this mean? Well, suppose I say that the car is blue. Um, is blue, is blue. That comes in many different varieties because there are many shades of blue. There are many different kinds of blue. Or if I say that Frank Zappa was a musician, again, is a musician, comes in many different varieties. There are many kinds of musicians. Some musicians play guitars, some musicians play trombones, some musicians compose without playing any particular instrument. So there's many varieties of blueness, many varieties of musicians. Identity, by contrast, has no varieties. Um, how could it? For X to be identical to Y is just for X to be Y. It's just for it to be itself. But everything is... Everything is itself, everything is perfectly itself, and there couldn't be, you know, how could there be more than one way for a thing to be itself? 
Um, and so this maybe accounts for why, you know, there can be no debate about identity. There's no, like, it, like ev everything has it <laughs> and it all has it in the same sense, right? Everything is itself and that's it and there's just nothing more to say. Now, there are, however, some objections to Lewis's view here. Um, one obvious point, which Lewis himself notes, is that we do seem to frame a lot of philosophical problems in terms of identity. So we ask, for instance, about the conditions of identity over time. Can the same object have different properties over time? I mean, this comes up in the context of debates about personal identity, right? Personal identity. Can a five-year-old be the same person as a 50-year-old? Can there be person, personal identity retained over time as the person changes? Like when I look at a photograph of myself as a five-year-old, I'm saying, well, that's, that's myself as a five-year-old. I'm saying that there is identity over time. Um, but like it, is, is that true? Does that actually make sense? Well, there's a big debate about this. There's a debate about what the conditions are of identity over time. Um, or think about debates about material composition. Um, is a chair identical to the collection of particles that composes the chair? Um, you know, so, I mean, one way to put all of this is that there appear to be different criteria of identity. You know, I mean, we've just said that identity is supposed to be simple and unitary, but actually it looks like there's different criteria. Under what conditions are two material objects the same? Well, perhaps if they occupy the same spatio-temporal locations, which is why we might then say that the particles arranged chair-wise are identical to the chair. If, if two material objects count as identical just in case they occupy the same spatio-temporal locations, then, you know, it looks like, okay, particles arranged chair-wise, that might be identical to the chair. Now, we can dispute whether this is the right criterion of, identical for, of identity for material objects, um, but surely it can't be the right criterion of identity for abstract objects. So, so identity is therefore not this simple primitive notion about which no debate can be had. OK, a couple of responses to this objection. So Lewis argues that in all of these cases of apparent debates of identity, it's not really identity that's actually in dispute. When we debate personal identity, we are debating whether a person can have different properties over time. When we debate material composition, you know, we're debating whether a collection of particles arranged chairwise is a chair. Um, so as Lewis puts it, we sometimes ask, is it ever so that an F is identical to a G? But we could just as well ask, is it ever so that an F is a G? So the identity drops out. There are plenty of interesting philosophical problems that we frame in terms of identity, but none of these problems arise due to identity itself. It's not we're not going to solve any of these problems by investigating the identity relation. There's nothing there. There's not. There's no problem there to investigate, um, and and none of these issues are arising because of the nature of the identity relation, the identity relation in itself. Um, now, of course, this response requires that whenever we face a problem that seems to be about identity, it can be rephrased in such a way that identity is not problematized. Um, I suppose that's plausible in many cases. But suppose that we can indeed rephrase all problems without explicit reference to identity. Does this show that identity is not what's in question? Or does it merely show that we don't have to use the word identity? I mean, so Lewis says, look, you know, we sometimes say, is an F identical to a G? But we could just as well say, is an F a G? And in that case, identity drops out. But, you know, we might think, well, look, if I ask, is an F a G, that might not use the word identity, but it still seems to be about identity in some sense. <laughs> um, I mean, it still se it seems like actually, you know, we're still, what we're still trying to communicate here is, is an F identical to a G? So, you know, the mere fact that we don't have to use the word identity doesn't mean that identity is, is, is not what we're talking about, right? That might be one worry. Um, so a different response, though, is given by uh, Colin McGinn in his book, Logical Properties. So he says, well, <clears throat> criteria of identity can vary, but this doesn't show that the identity relation itself can vary. So he uses the analogy that, 
there are many different kinds of things that can instantiate the colour blue. The car is blue and the sky is blue. For the car, blueness is a matter of the spectral reflectance properties of its surface. For the sky, blueness is produced by the scattering of light. But it doesn't follow that the blueness itself is variable here. The, so the car and the sky might still instantiate the same shade of blue. That shade of blue is produced by very different processes, but it might still be the same shade of blue. Um, similarly, all sorts of different things can instantiate the identity relation, but this doesn't show that the relation itself is different in each case. The same relation can be realised by different objects. An abstract object is identical to itself. A concrete object is identical to itself. Those are two very different kinds of objects, but the identity relation is the same. Um, it, it's this thing is identical to itself, and like, and and that's it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, no matter what kind of object you have, it's going to be identical to itself. But the so the object is different, but this relation, the the relation that it bears to itself of being identical to itself, that's the same in each case. All right then, a quick advert. If you like my channel, you can join my Patreon. Uh, I upload bonus videos on Patreon about once a week. Um, or you can just send a one-off donation on PayPal. Every little helps. Um, I also offer private tutoring, so email if you're interested in that. Um, private tutoring in philosophy, obviously. Also, I have a Discord. The links to all of this will be in the description. Okay, so... <clears throat> so it has been argued, um, not just that there is no debate about identity, but that identity can't even be defined, at least not in any informative way. Identity can't be analysed. Identity is so basic to our conceptual scheme that there is just nothing informative to be said about it. It is a primitive concept that cannot be defined in terms of other concepts, nor can it be grounded in anything else. You know, like identity is... Uh, it's it's not it's not defined in terms of other concepts. It's not something that is you know drawn from experience or anything like that. It is just this primitive basic concept. Okay, so first of all, consider the relation between identity and other logical laws. The argument would be that um, identity is going to underlie all of the other logical laws. So take for instance the law of non-contradiction. Um, Non-contradiction appears to presuppose identity. Why? Well, non-contradiction tells us that nothing can be both F and not F at the same time and in the same respect. Well, identity is looming pretty large here. What we're saying is that one and the same object cannot be both F and not F. There's no trouble at all if one object is F and another object is not F. What non-contradiction rules out is predicating F and not F, of the same thing. Similarly, we say that nothing can be both F and not F in the same respect. So I might say that a car is both red and not red because it has a red roof but black doors. Well, that doesn't violate non-contradiction because we're not predicating redness and non-redness of the same thing. Um, the car is red in one particular respect and it's not red in a different respect. But again, this is... Right, when we talk about the same respect, that's identity, right? So our grasp of the law of non-contradiction appears to presuppose identity. And if you think about other supposed logical laws, like you know, law of excluded middle, it's pretty easy to see how a similar argument can be made. Um, so identity seems to be like underlying all of these other uh, all of these other laws. Um, okay, so earlier we saw that. Identity obeys Leibniz's law. So could we then say that, well, Leibniz's law gives us the definition of, in, of identity. It gives us an informative analysis of identity. There are several problems with this. So Leibniz's law, recall, it says that if X is identical to Y, then X and Y share all the same properties. Everything true of X must be true of Y. But this has to include the identity relation itself. So we have to include when we say like X and Y share all the same properties, we have to include the property of being identical with X as one of the properties of Y. 
Because if y didn't have the property of being identical with x, well, then by stipulation, it wouldn't be identical with x. Uh, so, um, like, if we don't include identity as one of the properties, then Leibniz's law is insufficient. Um, but if we do include it, it's obviously circular. I mean, one way to say this is that it seems like... So Leibniz's law... Is, so if x is identical with y, then x and y share all the same properties. There's very little controversy about that, right? This is known as the, the indiscernibility of identicals. If two things are identical, then they're indiscernible. But there is uh, another law called uh, the identity of indiscernibles, which would say that if x and y share all the same properties, then x is identical with y. And um, at least on some ways of understanding what properties are, that has been brought into question, right? It seems like, so the argument might be, well, you know, imagine if you had like two universes, two separate universes, right? Couldn't there be two separate universes that are just completely the same? Like if you had an apple, so I'm holding an apple in this universe, my counterpart in the other universe is holding an apple, and those apples have exactly the same, you know, they're molecule for molecule identical, they have the, the same material composition, and they relate to other things in the rest of their universes in exactly the same way. You know, they, um, so they, they have, they occupy the same spatio-temporal location, right? So they seem to have all the same properties, but are they actually identical? Well, arguably not. Like, maybe that's coherent, right? Um, so, <clears throat> so when we, when we say, like, if X is identical with Y, X and Y share all the same properties, um, one of the properties that, that, that has to be attributed to y is being identical with x. Um, or Leibniz's law is, is going to be insufficient. Um, but if we do include that, then it's just obviously circular. Um, perhaps more seriously, Leibniz's law presupposes property identity. Because it says, okay, if x is identical with y, then x and y share all the same properties. And there it is, the same properties. The properties of x must be identical to the properties of y. If the properties weren't identical, then x and y wouldn't be identical, would they? Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, it's true that... So we want to say, yeah, identity obeys Leibniz's law, but it's not that Leibniz's law provides an informative definition. You're not going to be able to grasp uh, what Leibniz's law is unless you have a prior grasp of what identity is. Um, so, so Leibniz's law is... Um, you know, it's it's telling us how identity behaves, but, like, it's making explicit something we already have to accept. We already, like, implicitly know this. We already kind of have this primitive concept of identity, and Leibniz's law is just um, making explicit uh, what that concept is. But it's not really providing an informative definition, right? Um, now, regardless of any specific issues with Leibniz's law, there is a general reason why no informative definition can be given. Um, this argument is made by Colin McGinn in Logical Properties, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so suppose, suppose I propose that the concept of identity is defined as F. That could be anything, right? So I might say that identity is the equivalence relation that satisfies Leibniz's law, but I could say anything else, right? You propose anything you want as what defines identity. Well, in saying this, I am affirming the identity of two concepts. I am saying that the concept of identity is identical to F. So any definition that is given of identity presupposes that we grasp identity. Like when we give a definition, what we're saying is, we're saying like the concept C if I define the concept C in terms of some other concept C star, I'm saying the concept C is identical to C star. So, you know, although we can describe the properties of identity and the role that it plays and so on, we can't give a non-circular definition of it. Identity must be assumed in the very procedure of giving a definition. Identity is therefore primitive and undefinable. Um, notice that identity is presupposed in statements of the law of identity. So for all x, x equals x. Well, in order to understand what that means, we have to understand that each instance of x refers to the same thing. Uh, like uh, if, if x, if, if the x, if the x is referred to different things, you know, for all x, x equals x. If that, if that uh, second x referred to something different to the third x, well, no, right? That would be false. Or if I say everything is identical to itself, 
each thing is identical to itself, while the it has to pick out the same thing as the thing. Um, like thing and it refers to the same thing. Um, we need identity in order to understand the uh, anaphoric expression it. Okay, so the thought is, uh, you know, without identity, very little is intelligible. And and this is why there can be nothing substantive to say about identity. Any time we say anything substantive, we are presupposing identity. And maybe this explains why there is, that you know, there can be no debate about identity. Um, so maybe this would support uh, Lewis's view. Some philosophers have argued that identity is not a genuine relation. It's not a genuine property at all. I mean, maybe like to just begin to see this, we can just make a similar point to what Lewis said. So if you think about any identity statement, say Venus is identical with the morning star, I could just as informatively say Venus is the morning star. And I mean, identity drops out, right? Identity doesn't. So the, the thought is, you know, identity doesn't really tell us anything about the world, right? Um, at best, to say that X is identical with Y is just to say that X can be substituted for Y in some types of sentences. Not all sentences, of course. We've already seen the troubles that arise with sentences that attribute beliefs. Um, but the key idea of this view is identity is not actually a property. It's not a property in the world, but a kind of tool of inference. Uh, Wittgenstein seems to have endorsed this view throughout his career. Uh, in the Tractatus, he says, to say of two things that they are identical is nonsense, and to say of one thing that it is identical with itself is to say nothing. Um, so if we have two different apples, then the only sense we could make of saying that they are, they are identical would be as an affirmation of qualitative identity, not numerical identity. Like, if we have two different apples, then we've just stipulated that they're not identical. But, let's say I have one apple, and then I say, well, this one apple is identical to itself. Well, what am I even saying? I mean, I might as well just present the apple. I can say, I have an apple, right? I can say this, this proposition, I have an apple, fair enough. But then, then consider the proposition, I have an apple that is identical with itself. Uh, wh what is that saying? What's being added there? Or even just, you know, I can say I have an apple that is itself. Again, what is being said there? <laughs> it doesn't seem like anything informative is being added. It doesn't seem like we're, you know, like what would it be to, you know, believe one of these statements but not believe the other one? I mean, we might approach this in a slightly different way by considering what would be involved in denying the identity relation. So suppose that the apple were not itself. What would that mean? Um, it's very hard to say uh, how, like, it's very hard to, to make sense of this. Um, so, you know, you can't, the argument would be, well, look, you can't picture an apple that is not itself. No matter how many properties you visualize the apple as having, the apple is still itself, right? Like I can, I can have an apple in my mind, right? I can imagine an apple and, you know, I might imagine that it's crunchy. I might imagine it's rotten. I might imagine it's red or green or blue. I might imagine that it is the same shape as a chair. Like I can imagine, I might well actually be able to imagine that the apple just is a chair. So I have a, I imagine an apple, but I'm like, the apple is a chair. Maybe that's perfectly conceivable. But no matter what I'm imagining, this apple is still itself. Um, so, okay, it doesn't seem like I can, I can imagine something that is not itself, but nor does it seem as if we can make any, like, further inferences. So if I, if I say that the apple is not itself, and then we ask, well, what sorts of inferences can we make from that claim? Um, again, it's just not at all clear. Like, so I, so I, I make the claim, I have an apple that is not itself. Well, then, uh, what inferences do I make from this? Like, what, what should I predict would happen if I were to eat this apple that is not itself? Um, you know, who knows? I mean, there's just no, there's no obvious way of continuing this story. So, you know, I mean, the point is, is like, when we think about, okay, how do we conceptualize things? How do we assign meanings to things? How do we know that we have got like a grasp of what a statement means? Well, you know, we might make inferences, we might imagine things, but when it comes to this idea that an apple is not identical with itself, it, 
you know, it doesn't seem like we can imagine anything. It doesn't seem like we can make any particular inferences from that. It doesn't seem like we can tell a story about it. Um, so, you know, we can't, the idea would be, you can't make sense of what it would be to deny the identity relation. But in if it's completely nonsensical to deny the identity relation, nor is there going to be any sense in affirming it. Um, like, you know, the, it, it, it would be, it would be nonsensical to, um, to, to just as it's nonsensical to say, like, you know, if I deny that uh, there are flurbal derbs and I, I have no way of saying what it is for, for me to deny that there are flurbal derbs, it's also not going to make much sense to affirm that there are flurbal derbs, right? Um, so later in the philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein puts the point this way. He says, <clears throat> a thing is identical with itself. There is no finer example of a useless proposition, which is yet connected with a certain play of the imagination. It is as if in imagination we put a thing into its own shape and saw that it fitted. We might also say everything fits into its own shape, or again, everything fits <clears throat> everything fits into itself, or again, everything fits into its own shape. Um, but I suppose, you know, one, one could argue, well, you know, I can I can certainly sort of imagine, I can imagine something, you know, that like doesn't fit into a shape. I can imagine an apple, and then I can imagine the shape of an apple, and maybe the apple I'm imagining doesn't fit into the shape of the apple, uh, you know, sort of abstractly conceived. But if I imagine just a single apple. Right, and then I imagine the shape of that apple, so the the apple that I am imagining. Then, of course, that apple fits into its own shape. I mean, um, or at least it's still it's like there's not really a comparison being made here. It's not that I have I'm imagining the apple and then I'm imagining the shape and I'm seeing I'm comparing whether they fit. In that context, it would make sense to say that either the apple does fit into the shape or the apple doesn't fit into the shape. But if I just imagine an apple. And then I'm saying, oh, well, it fits into its own shape. I'm not actually comparing one thing with another. Um, you know, I'm just imagining an apple. And no matter how I change the apple, like if I change, <laughs> if I change the shape of the apple, then I'm changing the apple. Um, similarly, if I'm changing the apple, I'm changing the shape of the apple. OK, so th the idea then is, well, identity just isn't isn't actually a property. It's not it's not a genuine property, not a genuine relation. We might be misled into treating identity as a property because, of course, identity plays an important epistemic role. Let's say I'm talking to a man who introduces himself as Robert Zimmerman and I'm unaware of how he makes a living. And then a bit later, somebody informs me like, hey, that guy was Bob Dylan. Well, I've made an important discovery. I've discovered, oh, Robert Zimmerman is identical to Bob Dylan. But this is, the argument would be, this is not a discovery about the identity relation. Um, after all, regardless of whether Robert Zimmerman is Bob Dylan, Robert Zimmerman is supposed to bear the identity relation to himself, right? <laughs> um, and it's not as if I could, you know, I could like look at Bob Dylan and then look at Robert Zimmerman and compare them both and find that they do indeed bear the identity of relation to each other. Like when I when I look at Bob Dylan, I am looking at Robert Zimmerman. When I look at Robert Zimmerman, I am looking at Bob Dylan. Um, so I just what I discover is that these two names refer to the same person. We make these kinds of inferences and we we use this term identity in such cases. But the idea would be that the role that identity plays in these sorts of inferences is constitutive of what identity is. Objects do not literally bear some property of being identical to themselves. There is no such property. It's just like we discover that X is Y or that X is not Y and that's it. So like, consider an omniscient being who knows, or maybe near omniscient, who knows all of the facts about which things are the same or different. Like it knows all the facts about the reference of terms. It knows that Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman. It knows that Kane Baker is not the thief who stole the cookies. Since this being is omniscient, well, you know, it doesn't have any need to think about the identity relation. Suppose we, we add to its picture of the world that all things are identical to themselves. Um, so we add that Robert Zimmerman is identical to himself. What change does this make? What inferences are available to the being that were not available before? Well, again, it's hard to see what that would even mean. It's, it 
doesn't seem like anything's being affirmed here. Now, there is, I think, kind of an obvious issue with all these arguments, which is we saw in the previous section that many philosophers treat identity as a primitive concept that is presupposed by almost any other claim, in which case it's to be expected that statements about identity would be trivial and would kind of add nothing to our picture of the world, while denying identity, as in, you know, the apple is not itself, would be incoherent. Because, the, you know, if identity is in fact this primitive concept, primitive property, then by giving a picture of the world, you just are giving a picture that includes identity. So when I say, well, you know, think about this omniscient being um, that, like, it knows that Bob Dylan is Robert Zimmerman. Well, like, it, so this being can picture Bob Dylan insofar as it does that. It just is picturing something that is identical to itself. And maybe this being doesn't think in terms of the term identity, but the being, but, but when it pictures Bob Dylan, it still is just picturing something identical to itself. Um, the thing that it's picturing has that property. Um, so, yeah, I mean... Whether, you know, do we say identity is a kind of indefinable primitive uh, concept or do we say that identity just isn't a property at all? Um, it's, yeah, maybe there's, uh, it's a bit unclear. Uh, there is another way to deny that identity is a genuine property. And this is the idea that there is no absolute identity, only relative identity. Um, I, I'm going to be quite brief here. I should say that the literature on relative identity is uh, is fairly large and technical, um, so I'm just going to briefly summarise some of the the thoughts. Um, but this relative identity thesis, this has been defended by Peter Geech, who summarises it as follows. He says, when one says X is identical with Y, this I hold is an incomplete expression. It is short for X is the same F as Y, where F represents some count noun understood from the context of utterance. So, the traditional way of thinking about identity is that identity is absolute. We say X is identical with Y, or X is the same as Y, simpliciter. Right, that's it. Right, X is identical with Y, that's it. On Geech's view, this is nonsensical. We can only affirm identity or sameness relative to some sortal, right? So I can only say X is the same F as Y. X is an identical F as Y. Okay, so... To see how this works, um, it's it's useful to consider the motivation for it. Geech appeals to some of the paradoxes associated with ordinary objects. So one famous case is the case of Tib and Tibbles. Uh, Tibbles is an ordinary cat sitting on a mat. Now consider Tibbles minus his tail, right? Draw a line around Tibbles, but don't include the tail. Call this Tib. Tib has different properties from Tibbles. And Tib is smaller. Tib doesn't have a tail. But Tib appears to be a cat. Indeed, notice that Tibbles could lose his tail, in which case Tib and Tibbles would both occupy exactly the same space and be composed of exactly the same particles. Surely Tibbles would still be a cat, right? Tibbles would be a cat even if his tail came off in an accident. Um, but that, that's just to say that Tibbles minus his tail is a cat. So it looks like Tib is a cat. Now, here's the problem. Intuitively, we're inclined to say that there is one cat on the mat. Like, if you go into the room and somebody says, okay, tell me how many cats there are on the mat, you'd look at the mat, <laughs> you'd say, okay, there's one cat there. But this argument appears to show that there are at least two cats on the mat. Tib and Tibbles. Tib is a cat, Tibbles is a cat, they're both different. Uh, so there's two cats on the mat. And, uh, of course, we can generate plenty more cats using the same sort of procedure. So there's going to be millions, billions of cats on the map. Now, what Geech says about this is there is indeed only one cat on the map because Tibbles is the same cat as Tib. But there are different individuals on the map. Tibbles is a different individual from Tib. Um, the term individual here being used in a, a somewhat technical sense. So we're initially inclined to ask, is Tib identical to Tibbles? Right? Is Tib the very same thing as Tibbles? Geech says this makes no sense because we haven't specified what kind of thing we're talking about. So Tib is the same cat as Tibbles. Tib is the same animal as Tibbles. But Tib is not the same lump of matter as Tibbles. 
right? This lump of matter that is Tibbles has a has a tail, right? Tib doesn't. Uh, Tib is not the same individual as Tibbles. So it can be that X and Y are the same F, while they are not the same G. And to be clear, in this case, we're supposing that X and Y are both, you know, they're both G's. So, um, you know, like Tib and Tibbles are both individuals. Tib and Tibbles are both lumps of matter, but they're not the same individuals. They're not the same lumps of matter. So if we were counting F's, then we would count X and Y as one thing. If we were counting cats, we count Tib and Tibbles as one thing. If we're counting G's, we count X and Y as different things. So if we're counting G's, if we're counting lumps of matter, we count Tib and Tibbles as different things. But what we can't do is we can't count absolutely. We have to specify what kind of thing we are counting. So this, on this view, um, the same F relation does not satisfy Leibniz's law. Tib is the same cat as Tibbles. But Tib has different properties from Tibbles. If, if Tib is the same cat as Tibbles, if that satisfied Leibniz's law, we would have to conclude that uh, Tib and Tibbles are actually different cats. Um, but this, of course, would undermine the reason for introducing relative identity in the first place. Um, so, yeah, if X is the same cat as Y was to satisfy Leibniz's law, then Tib and Tibbles would be different cats. Um, but of course, this does raise a question, which is, well, if this same F relation doesn't satisfy Leibniz's law, then why treat it as any kind of identity relation? I mean, I think a lot of philosophers would suppose that Leibniz's law is just kind of, it's essential to what identity is. It's non-negotiable. Um, but, you know, we might say, well, look, this relation of relative identity, this is going to be playing basically the same sort of epistemic and inferential role that we've discussed previously. So when it comes to things like, you know, Bob Dylan and and Robert Zimmerman. I mean, I can just say, okay, these are two names, right? They're the same same musician. Um, you know, or the, like when I discover that I am not the one who stole, when I show you that I'm not the one who stole the cookies, for instance, um, maybe relative identity can be playing that same that same sort of role. Um, anyway, that was just a you know brief introduction to some of the um, claims that philosophers have made about identity. I um, I think I'm going to leave it there. I hope you found that interesting and I will, of course, see you in the next video. Uh, bye, everybody.